here we go, we're live. So, if you joined me yesterday, I created the song in uh, Logic Pro. And today, uh, yeah, I'm in Ableton Live 10. Mainly because I updated, uh, yeah, my operating system to the Java or whatever it's called. And yeah, for some reason, for me, Logic Pro 10 doesn't work. So yeah, it's pretty annoying. I've spent a lot of time messing around, reinstalling, deleting. Doesn't work. However, this is why knowing two digital audio workstations is a useful thing. Um, because I use Ableton Live. So yeah, it was gonna be Logic Pro, it was gonna continue with the song I made yesterday. However, gotta make something new. It's the way it is. And yeah, you forget how annoying software is or can be. Um, but yeah, cool. The show must go on, as they say. Right, so uh, all the complete stuff still works in here. So like battery and uh, contact and all that. Um, so yeah, just different platform at the end of the day. You never know, being forced to do something different, it can give you some new creative ideas, but we'll see in this live stream. So yeah, thank you for people joining me. Howdy, how are you all doing? If you, this is also a live Q&A, so if you've got any questions, um, unfortunately I, I won't be able to show you in Logic Pro, but if you've got any questions about music production, uh, music theory, music composition, that kind of thing, uh, let me know. Another great thing about creating music for me, it's very therapeutic. So it's quite relaxing because me messed around with software, it stresses me out so much. But playing some music, relaxing, chilling out, hopefully by the end of the session, be a lot more relaxed. And hopefully if you make music at home, you're a bit stressed out, um, play some music, pick up a guitar, play the piano. Um, yeah, uh, Umar FM, why aren't you using Logic? Um, I updated to, um, I can't even say it, Majavi, the new, say newish operating system. And uh, my Logic Pro just doesn't work. Um, so, I, yeah, I don't know. Can't get it to work. Um, so I'm using Ableton Live 10 instead. Um, so I think it's a good idea to know two or more. Well, two is probably fine, DAWs. But anyway, let's play something. Uh, I might start with a drum beat this time. Let's get like a 110 beat. Um, yeah. Put the metronome on. Slow it down. Play that pretty out of time. Let me see if we can get the, um, Shortcuts, because if I hit Q, it's going to quit. It's not going to quantize like logic. So uh, this one is a uh, command U. Yeah. <laughs> so that's the thing about using different applications and other stuff like Photoshop or whatever. You get. Yeah, you can get a little confused with it. I know you can obviously copy over the, um, uh, the shortcuts. Yeah, that kicks doesn't really suit this uh, style I'm after, so I'm going to open up battery and let's. Uh... That one might work, this kick. Where's that on the keyboard? Oh, it's an octave below. Okay, so if I bring up the MIDI and put an octave below, let's see if I can remember the shortcuts. Oh yeah, I need a little headphone icon. Cool. That's better. The snare's a little weak as well. Might try the one on E. Uh, can't hear me too well. Okay, let me turn up my interface. Is this any better? I'm probably just speaking too quietly, to be fair. 
uh, yeah, cool. Hi from Halifax. Ah, oh, hey, Strumble. How you doing? I've been to Halifax before. It's not too far from where I am. Okay, that's that's getting somewhere. Right, so the first bit works, the second bit, no idea what I'm doing there. Um, yeah. Cool, cheers, Strumble. Yeah, if the levels or anything that aren't right, let me know. Um, yeah. Cool. Still not too happy with that snare sound, but I can always change it later on. Um, I'm probably going to be lazy and use a bit of a... It's not lazy. It's just getting a simp. I'm going to use a serum. I'm going to. I was going to get the LFO LFO tool uh, plugin today as well. That looks pretty cool. Uh, obviously, you do get the LFO stuff on serum, but adding it to other instruments or drums or stuff, I thought it'd be pretty awesome. Um, but I spent the last few hours messing around trying to get Logic Pro to not work. Um, yeah. Just gonna uh, stick a limiter on the ch -ch 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 output bus, the master. You never know, just in case. Right, so I'm just gonna jam some ideas out and see what happens. Uh, yeah, let me know if you've got any comments, questions, anything like that, and let us know. the white stripes. <laughs> uh, let's just keep it simple for now. Yeah, let's just uh, yeah, get rid of that B flat thing. What? Oh. That wasn't. Ha. Yeah, uh, that wasn't what I wanted. That sounds alright. Yeah, I'm getting all the shortcuts mixed up. Bam, 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 bam. Yeah, that's pretty cool. So sometimes me playing in something really badly or making mistakes, can make something else because I wouldn't have normally played that in. Uh, yeah. Cool. I'm gonna copy those drums over as well, but just have a straight kick the next time as well. Strumble, do you run classes? Uh, yeah, have a have a chat to Christopher in the talk. So he's part of Digital Music Masters. Uh, right, so what am I on about? It? It's straight. I mean, um, I mean the snares. Got insane. I'm just gonna keep it like, you know, two and four, keep it simple. Uh, tsh -tsh -tsh. So let's uh, color that differently.
I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Hey Kev, how you doing? Just copy the first one. I'm just kind of getting some grooves out. Um, so yeah, thanks for people watching. If you just joined the stream, I'm using Ableton Live because my Logic Pro just decided to break, uh, which is really annoying. So I can't continue with the other project. Um, but yeah, whatever. Let's, let's see what happens. So I'm just kind of just laying down some simple stuff at the moment. Um, I might stick on a like a pad or a chord, a chord and arpeggiator, uh, yeah. Let's go for that one. No, I will, I will, I will use serum actually. So this, ah, people are in the chat, how you doing? Yeah, cheers for joining me, Chris. And Kev and all the people watching, let us know whereabouts you're from. Some people from Liverpool, Halifax, Manchester, cool. All the, the UK squad in the house. It's just uh, Let's just play around with a preset for start with. Ooh. Of course, it doesn't want to work. Surface control. Okay, let me try something else. It seems like, yeah. Huh. Serum's not working now. Man, all these software stuff. Right, the MIDI keyboards aren't working now. Okay, let's see what we've got. Hmm, interesting. Hmm, all right, so. Keyboards aren't working now. This is what happens when you do a live stream, eh? Anyway, so let's use, uh, let's use some musical typing. So, uh, I was just playing a C, so maybe I should use a C minor. Some chords, so I leave the bass there, but create some movement as well. Uh, I just start off with C minor, keep it simple. Oh, terrible sound, I'll change that after. Yeah. Uh, let's let's drag this to a. Uh, uh, to a bar. Yeah, I'll be confused. Why? MIDI keyboards triggering, but not the synth. Interesting. Is Ableton very similar to Logic Pro? Um, I'd say the arrangement view is. So if you have a look over here, um, if we hit tab, this view here, this is this is pretty similar to Logic Pro, to be honest. Um, so you can record on a linear fashion. Uh, but what most people do in Ableton Live is they kind of create little clips in the session view. So this is this view here. So what each one of these little blocks is kind of a, a chunk of either audio or MIDI information. And going down is the different instruments. And you can add effects this way as well. And then what people normally do is they record this into the arrangement view and then arrange it from here. Um, it's got some pros and cons for both. For example, there is main stage, which I honestly really don't like, to be honest. Oh, yeah, I don't like main stage, which is kind of Logic Pro's equivalent of Ableton Live. So if you want to do any kind of um, live, anything live performance, Ableton Live, that's why it's called live, because it's due for live performance is awesome. Um, if you want to do any remixing, we you get something called warping in Ableton Live. I know there's a new, um, uh, smart tempo controls and logic, but in Ableton Live, the warping's awesome. So if you want to do the remixing, um, 
any like mixtapes, live performance. It's really cool. There's some really interesting stuff in here as well, um, such as the drum rack, the sampler, the simpler. So if you want to do like sampling, Ableton Live I prefer, but Logic I generally prefer as kind of an overall digital audio workstation. It, Logic's good for everything really. It's great for mixing. I really like the mixing layer in Logic Pro. Um, however, I'm not really a fan of mixing in Ableton Live, but for live performance, for mixtapes, for certain types of electronic dance music, it's really cool. Uh, Logic Pro, yeah, for live performance, no. I, I used uh, main stage several years ago now as for a live show and uh, the laptop actually crashed. And since then, I, was, I haven't even looked at main stage. So it was probably me having a, a pretty bad laptop MacBook at the time, but yeah, I like uh I like Logic Pro for composing generally and able, I don't know, I like Logic Pro for mixing. I like Ableton Live and Logic Pro for composing, I'd say. But yeah, both different. Some people much prefer certain ones, but yeah, let me know in the chats uh, what DAW you use and why. Um, Logic Pro is a lot more inexpensive than Ableton Live. It's like, what, like $200 compared to $600 for Suite. So yeah, pros and cons of each. And Logic Pro has got some really cool like instruments built in as well. Um, really cool piano sounds, really cool like loops. Ableton's got some pretty good ones as well, but not as many. Uh, Umar FM says mixing and logic logic is difficult for me because of system overlay. Yeah, it's, yeah. Um, I recommend. Well, you want to get a faster Mac really, but it's not always something you can do. But there's yeah, freeze tracks, do a lot of freezing, do a lot of bounce downs. What I used to do on my old Mac was um, I would just spend ages just working on a certain type of uh, instrument. So I'd just do the synths, I'd just do the basses, I'd just do the drums. And once I've finished mixing that, I'd bounce them down, freeze all the tracks. Well, I'd freeze them all, not work on them, and then work on another section, freeze that. So I'd do instruments at a time and freeze each bit. That would stop a lot of the time um, system overload. And if it still did that, I'd make another project and I'd uh, bounce all of the software instruments or MIDI instruments into audio and stick it in another one and have like 10 different projects for different groups of instruments in, and just do each section at a time if you are getting system overload. Um, because, yeah, it uses up a lot of juice, unfortunately. It's kind of the way it is. Uh, Strumble recently got Logic Pro on MacBook Air. Cool, yeah. Um, MacBook Air is fine, I'd say, for if, you, if you're making tracks, if you're... Um, if you're not using that many plugins, but if you're using a lot of plugins, a lot of third-party synths, um, such as Serum, for example, uses up a lot of CPU. If you're using something like Contact as well by Native Instruments, tons of CPU, you might want to look at um, getting something more powerful. But if you just write music, it's absolutely fine. Um, but yeah, I, I've used MacBook Air, yeah, a couple of MacBook Airs in the past. Great for traveling, great for... Um, just putting ideas down, but if you want to do some serious mixing, it might struggle. But if it doesn't, cool. Yeah. Anyway, what was I doing? For some reason, my keyboards aren't triggering. But yeah, I I was say to myself, uh, there's a video online of Skrillex talking about some time when he was on tour, and he did a lot of his um a lot of his tracks and a lot of his remixes on a copy of Ableton Live 8, I think it was at the time, with a pair of headphones and a laptop. That's all he did, that's all he had. So me complaining about not having a MIDI keyboard working, just think Skrillex did all those tracks just with musical typing. So, yeah. Sometimes you can come up with different ideas, like if I'm just playing the piano or, the, or keyboard, I'm probably just gonna be uh, playing the same chords over and over again. I'm just gonna be playing the same patterns that I know. If I'm forced to do something different, I'm going to have to think outside the box. Um, which is why I've started playing the guitar recently, because I haven't played the guitar in ages. I don't really know it that well, which is good for writing songs, because I've got completely different shapes and ideas. I don't really know what, like on the, on the piano, I know how to play like a C major 7, a D minor 7 flat 5, or I don't know, like all the different modes and stuff. I know all that on the keyboard. I've studied it a long time, but the guitar, if someone said to me, play... Uh, I don't know, like a D Dorian scale, I won't, I won't be able to do it. On the piano, super easy, but on the guitar, not so easy. So it's more just messing around and having a bit more fun. 
which uh, has helped me come up with some uh, new ideas. Uh, yeah. Cool. Strumble says, uh, thank you for your feedback on my setup. Pro X uh, plus MacBook Air. I'm new, so I'm experimenting with inbuilt instruments and loops. Yeah, cool. If you're, if you're just experimenting with loops and different instruments, a MacBook Air is perfectly fine. Um, if you're getting a load of different system overloads, loads of different crashes, and um, it's just not powerful enough, consider updating, upgrading, or, or whatever. But if it's working fine, yeah, just leave it as it is. Um, you don't really need, like, an iMac Pro or whatever, unless you're, I don't know, you're using Premiere Pro or loads of different plugins or Premiere Pro is a, a video application or something that uses up a load of different juice, loads of CPU, then get something powerful. If not, just, yeah, just use a Mac Mini or a Mac, I'm, uh, MacBook Air or whatever, if whatever works at the end of the day. You did, like that new uh, i9 processor by uh, <laughs> Apple, apparently, yeah, it's, it's just not worth the money. It's not worth getting, so... I don't know, only get it if you need it. There's no point no point spending this like especially Apple products, man, they uh they're pretty pricey for some for what you get. But yeah. I've I've always considered getting there like a custom built um computer. But this is why Apple's is so good because you know apart from Logic Pro today and my MIDI keyboards right now, but you know if you get an Apple product, it's gonna work. It might not have the most functionality, it might not be the quickest, however, it's gonna work, it's gonna be good, it's gonna be perfectly fine. If you get a custom-built PC and it breaks, what are you gonna do? You're gonna have to get specialist round, it's gonna be a lot of faffing around. If you just get a MacBook and it breaks, obviously it's gonna cost a lot of money. You can just go to the store, the shop, as we call it in England, and just buy another one, so, yeah. Christopher says, lol, it just works. Yeah, that's the thing about Apple stuff, yeah. I I have a love-hate relationship with a lot of Apple stuff, with Apple products, but at the end of the day, it works. Like the iPhone, why can you not remove the SIM card? Why can you not, like, yeah, exporting videos on there, airdrop takes forever, but it works. It's Apple, yeah. Uh, Strumble, I'm intended to keep it simple, being disciplined for now. I use external storage to dump my learning creations projects too. Yep, cool. Another thing I'd recommend is always have a time machine backup of every single hard drive you have because hard drives break and when they break, it's not fun. Um, but if you've got a time machine backup of each one, um, it breaks, you've got a backup. And also get cloud storage. Uh, I use a, yeah, loads of them. There's like iCloud, Dropbox. There's an Amazon one which... I don't really rate, but Dropbox is great, Google Drive's great, iCloud is great, well, unless you get hacked, <laughs> but I doubt they want to hack any of our projects. Um, but yeah, so get some cloud storage as well. Batblaze, Chris says, I used to use Batblaze, I much prefer Dropbox, but Batblaze, you get a lot more bang for your buck with Batblaze, it is a lot more cost efficient, um, but I don't really like its interface personally. Dropbox for me. And Google Drive are the good ones, I think. But yeah, I used to use Backblaze a while ago, but I stopped using it. But yeah, get get Time Machine backup of everything and get cloud storage of everything because, yeah, I've had hard drives break before. I actually created a course a while ago. It's a couple of years ago. And uh, the whole course was on the hard drive and the hard drive <laughs> broke. And uh, yeah, lost it. But it was, only, it was only a little mini course, but it's still, it's still a few days work and it was... It's really annoying. Uh, mic. Let's see what you said. Just move this mic over. Oh, not that mic, this mic. Uh, I have VSL Hackintosh. Okay, cool. Yeah, like I'm sure Hackintosh Hackintosh is work, but like I said, it's one another one of those things where it's more kind of messing around and faffing about. Um, which Yeah, I don't I really hate doing. Like if you're good at this stuff and you understand what you're doing, I'm sure Hackintosh or custom built PC is awesome. But for me, you get stressed out when Logic Pro went open. Creating a Hackintosh or creating a custom-built computer, it's just too too many nightmares for me personally. But if you're into that stuff, if you're good at the kind of tech and working stuff out, yeah, why not? Cool. Strumble says, subscribe to my Udemy course and watch a few videos. Brilliant so far. Cheers, man. I hope you yeah, I hope you found them useful. 
Uh, yeah, I'm just kind of talking to the chat at the moment. People watching on the replay be like, why isn't he making some music in Ableton Live? Why are you talking to these people? But this is kind of a, a live Q&A session as well as uh, creating some songs. So if you want to ask me any questions, I'm welcome to talk to everyone here or I can make some music or a bit of both. I'm happy to answer any. Uh, can you talk about how you use internal external drives for software plugin session files examples? Okay, so it's actually plugged in. I've got a big two terabyte hard drive back there called uh, Complete and Samples. So that has uh, all the complete files on because I've recently bought Complete, which takes up a load of space, and all of my different sample packs that I've bought. Um, I did use uh, sounds.com, Splice, that kind of thing, download them. So I stick them all in this hard drive. Um, all the, like, the VSTs and stuff I leave on the Mac, but the, all the samples, because if you're using something like um, Contact, these libraries are huge. Um, like, I mean like hundreds of gig. So I put everything on this two terabyte hard drive and I've also got a time machine backup of that two terabyte hard drive. I just make sure when I'm making music, I plug that hard drive in so I don't keep it on the, the Mac because it's just gonna take up too much space. It's gonna slow it down. And I wanna have a really like a load of different samples or a load of different instruments just for a bit of fun really. Um, yeah. Yeah, Chris has put in the chat, uh, it's advisable to run projects external to keep system for software. Yeah, then both external and internals get backed up in two places. Yeah, I agree. Cool. Um, yeah. Um, it depends what you're doing. If you're just messing around with loops and you haven't really got that many um, sample packs or anything, just have them on your Mac. But when you start to build up big collections of libraries, if you have anything like Vengeance, or um, if you're on, well then you, I recommend going on Sounds or Splice, uh, and you're downloading loads of different samples, um, it builds up after time, so you wanna keep your Mac as free as possible, I would say, yeah. But anyway, what was it doing? I'm just gonna uh, unplug this MIDI keyboard while I'm here. If anyone's got any questions, uh, Chris says Logic now officially supports hosting samples and loops in an external drive. Oh, do you mean the, um, the Apple loops or external loops? Okay. It was me being the idiots because monitor wasn't on. Okay, cool. <laughs> Yeah, right, so um, let's just write some chords in here. Uh, I'll play some chords. Uh, what I like to do as well is I've got two different keyboards. I've got one little one right next to me all the time, if you can see it, and I've got uh, a bigger 49 key one here, and I've got an 88 key in another room as well. Um, but that's just for playing the piano. So that's what I like to do. Um, Might do that, C minor, then a C minor 7, uh, then a, uh, what was the last one, uh, B flat? A flat, yeah. Cool. Uh, da, 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 da. I just realised on the uh, the live stream yesterday, I was humming a South Park song about the the uncle. I won't repeat the uh, the title. I just realised listening back today, I was humming that song there. Shut your face, uncle. That one. Yeah, so. Bit of a bit of random stuff. Yeah, cheers for dropping on the stream, Chris. Catch you later, man. I might be calling you later to uh, help me uh, sort out Logic Pro. Chris is a Logic Pro master. Oh, let's use this keyboard.
might just start with that chord, build it up rather than trying to jump in and do everything. Just start with a C, uh, and it replaces one of the um. Yeah, it just brings the last. One. So I might just do that. Cool, and let's go into Serum and have a little play around with this. Uh, have a little play around with the synth because it sounds. Nah, it doesn't sound bad, it just. It's not what I want. There. Cool. Uh, ch -ch -ch -ch. Right. I'll just start off with a simple sine wave for now. Uh, I might stick an arpeggiator on it. In, in a particular key, uh, yeah, I'm in a C minor. Um, any tips on how to lay down multiple takes playing alongside a loop and for each one to get its own clip? Uh, lay down multiple takes. Depends um, what the loop is. If it's stuff you made yourself, I'd think of the uh, kind of harmony you're using. If you're new to music theory, start with the root, third, fifth, or maybe the seventh. When you get a little bit more advanced, you can try stuff like uh, nines, elevens, stuff like that. Um, <clears throat> so it's Trumbles, put, um, be new to Logic Pro. I have what might seem a basic question, self-learning. What is a plugin? So a plugin is like uh, basically an effect that you add on to the instrument. So it could be like a, a reverb as a plugin or a compressor. Um, but yeah, I suppose it's just an effect. You get different types. You get audio plugins, which is uh, which gets added on after. So after the signal's been processed, then you add audio. So you can see these little dots here. 
after this has been processed and the MIDI one which is before it goes to the synth so you're processing the MIDI information so that's stuff like an arpeggiator, a randomizer that kind of thing. So that's affecting the MIDI information and the audio effect is affecting the, the audio signal. Yeah, it's basically, basically what a plugin is. I played some wrong notes there, <laughs> but I was just kind of uh, just moving up the top note to go change the chord a little bit each time. Yeah, thanks to people watching the live stream by the way. If you've got any questions, let me know. Um, I was planning to work on the track I was using yesterday, but if you just joined the live stream, uh, for some reason they updated to Logic's new uh, operating system, um, Apple's new one, and yeah, Logic won't work. So, yeah. Plugins. Uh, I th you thought plugins were something you had to purchase? Uh, no. So, for example, in uh, Ableton Live here, these are all free. Well, if you're using Ableton Live Suite, these are all ones that are included. And you get audio effects, so you get loads of them here as well. Like, to be honest, you can make great music just using the... You get something called stock, which stock basically means it's included with the software. So just using the stock plugins, there's loads of stuff you can do here. Like, some of these are really cool. Like, Beat Repeat is a lot of fun. Auto Pan. Uh, the EQ is pretty decent, Ableton Live EQ8. Uh, yeah, some nice ones in here. The vocoder is good fun. Uh, but then you get something called... Um, Third party plugins, like here we've got a section called plugins. So this is stuff like, uh, yeah, by other companies basically. So, so that's by, you might hear something like, um, sp um, I don't know, like Waves or Native Instruments or whoever, like loads of companies that make different plugins. Um, yeah, so and people always do refer to like instrument plugins as well. So different synthesizers can be, to call the plugin. It's a little confusing, but um, yeah, plugin is just something that really just yeah to affect the sound. MIDI plugin and an uh, audio plugin. It's probably a better expl <laughs> explanation out there, but that's just off the top of my head. Uh, so we got uh, Max. Do you have any tips on making bass loops? I'm just starting out with Ableton music creation and have no clue how to use bass optimal. Um, I would say listen to a lot of dance music and try and listen to what the bass, well, it depends what kind of music you want to make, but for me, I listen to a lot of dance music, so just think uh, the whole point of dance music is for people to dance to it, so you want the kick and the bass to be driving, you want people to be moving to it, so have listened to a lot of music, and if it's making you want to groove around and making you want to dance, nine times out of ten, that's because of the kick drum and the bass. Just listen what they're doing. You, ideally, you don't. You want some space for the bass to be heard as well, which is why you can do something called sidechain, which is where you basically duck down um, the volume of the, the bass when the, the kick's playing, and that can create a bit of a, a bit more movement for the kick drum to be heard. But really, dance music's it's that, it's that kick and the bass drum. So, obviously, if you're making different styles of music, it's, it's not about that. Or if you hear any kind of Latin music, it's really about... The, the rhythmical uh, rhythmical elements. So yeah, I'd have a listen to just listen to loads of loads of house. Uh, well, it doesn't have to be house. Any music that makes you want to dance. Um, so yeah. So yeah, to make the bass optimal. Keep it simple, really. Think about the rhythm. I wouldn't try and do any funky Jaco Pastorius style bass lines if you're trying to make electronic music. Generally, I, you do get people like Square Pusher who are pretty out there, but. Um, yeah, just keep it keep it simple. Think of the groove. Think how is this going to make more... Well, it depends what it's for. I like to make a lot of weird music a lot of the time just for fun. But if you're trying to make dance music for a crowd, if you want to make, if you want people to DJ your music, the nightclub, for example, the whole point is to dance and to move. So just think how, how will this music affect the mood of the people around, around me who listen to this music. Um, yeah, I would. But... Um, Kev says, is it best to add plugins as you create a track or wait to the mixing stage? Um, 
I would say you use them as you're creating the track. I think nowadays the term producer, it doesn't, what does that even mean? It, the term producer now means, I don't know, like you get different types. Like Christopher was just on the chat, he's a mixing engineer, so he doesn't really make music, but he mixes music. For me, I create music and I mix it at the same time. So when I'm making music, I'll be making it as I'm doing it, I'll be mixing like the, I want to be designing the sound, I want to be, yeah, I kind of mix it, mixing is part of the compositional process for me. Um, the old school mix engineer be like, no, 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 you write the song, buddy, I'll do the mixing. But nowadays, like, term producer, you've, you've, you've got to do it all, really. You've got, you've, got, you've got to be able to compose, you've got to write melodies, chords, harmonies, you've got to be able to mix. Uh, I recommend learning mastering as well. And that's not even getting onto the side of marketing and getting your music out there. So yeah, the term, yeah, I would say mix it as you go along, really. Um, yeah. Get some water. Uh, Strumble. Well, average as a guide, how many tracks are used to create a basic dance music track? Uh, do you mean by different, what, like different instruments? Or, um, I don't know, man. It depends. If you're doing like minimal house, it's not going to be that many. But if you're doing something a bit more, a bit more out there, I was watching um, what's he called? Armin van Buren's masterclass, and some he was saying some of his projects have like 200 instruments. I think I might have uh, messed up that quote, but yeah, some of the tracks I've worked on have had 100 different instruments, and some of the worked on have had five. Um, Jane says, "Can you explain the effects sends A and B and how they relate to track A and B master?" So the effect set, the effect sends is, is these little dials here, and all this basically does is just uh, yeah send all this information to another track. So it allows you to add effects, um, so you can blend different uh, instruments um, effects together. If that makes sense. So for example, if I go on uh, audio effects and uh, reverb, I stick it on a uh, well, it's already got reverb there, but on this one here. So I just use this one. For this example. Uh, for for sends as well, you want to have the wet all the way all the way up, or you're just gonna duplicate uh, the dry signal, which you don't want. You want wet all the way up. Uh, I'm just gonna make a huge one just for this example. You probably won't use this normally like this. Okay, and then when I play this sound, obviously hear the reverb there. And instead of dragging on a separate reverb um, effect onto the, this bass line, for example, I probably wouldn't use this much <laughs> reverb on the bass. Just drag this send all the way up. And they're both sharing the same reverb. So if I just uh, turn this off, there's no reverb, turn it on. So it's a good way, A, to save process and power, and B, to get the same reverb um, on different instruments. Otherwise, you're kind of blending different reverbs together and it might kind of clash a little bit. So, yeah. Uh, Strummel says without overloading complexity on the tracks. Uh, what do you mean? How many um, how many tracks? Without uh, without over overloads really dependent on how powerful um, your computer is. To be honest, um, if you're doing like if you're writing an orchest an orchestral piece, you're gonna have a lot of instruments. To be honest, if you're just writing a singer songwriter track, you might only have a few. It it depends. It depends. I would say, what do you want this song for? Who is it for? And what do you want to happen? What do you vision in your head? And try and recreate that. Rather than saying, I'm going to have 47 instruments on this one, or I'm going to have two. Um, it really depends. If it's a nice single songwriter track, you might just want a vocal track and a guitar track. Maybe a, a room mic. Like, if you hear, if, yeah, man, you hear tracks, you hear albums like Kind of Blue. Um, by uh, Miles Davis, and um, that, I think that was just filmed, uh, filmed. I think that was just recorded with uh, with one mic, and when it was your turn to take a solo, you just stand closer to the mic. So, yeah, that's just what, one stereo track, I guess, so it depends, it really depends. Uh, but normally, I don't know, maybe like 20 tracks, I'm not, I don't know, it, it depends, depends what you want. Yeah, it depends what you're after, but 
really you don't want too much going on. If you do, you're just kind of layering subtly. If you don't want too much muddiness in your mix, you want each instrument to be heard clearly. So I wouldn't just add loads and loads and loads of tracks just for the sake of it. Um, I would only put stuff in there if it's needed. But then you hear like a classic rock band or a classic pop band. What is it like? Guitar, bass, drums, vocals, maybe keyboards. They're not really using that many different tracks. But when they're recording, you hear that guitar sound, especially in heavy metal. There's not one guitar track there. There might be like ten. So yeah, you hear people like uh, Phil Spector who uh, he did a lot of the wall of sound stuff. Like there's a lot of different instruments. So if you hear, listen to something like the Ronettes. So many different instruments in that. Just a huge soundscape of sound. But yeah, man, it depends. It depends what you want to do. It depends what you want to what you're visioning. Or well, a lot of the time when I'm making music, I'm just kind of jamming out. Um, sometimes I have a vision in my head, or I might do some kind of visual scores, actually write down what I want to happen. But a lot of the time, I'm just kind of messing around, having fun, jamming out, and hope that something decent happens. A lot of the time, it's like warming up. It's like doing this sport. Like you're not going to be that that good at the start. It takes me a while to kind of get my flow, get relaxed. And after a while, I'm kind of get relaxed. So something like Ableton Live is cool because you can create those little clips. And for me, most of the clips at the start aren't very good and then you gradually build more stuff and then I kind of delete a lot of clips, make an arrangement from all these different clips. But I'd say if I'm making a three minute piece of music, it's normally at least 20 minutes of music I've written and then I condense it down, get rid of all the gunk and just keep the good stuff, I think. But everyone has a different um, a different way of working. Um, I know a lot of people that work just for making drum beats and build from there. I know some people who, who are just singer-songwriters who build from there. I know people who are pianists who just play piano chords and build from there. It it depends. I would just say just mess around with a load of different ideas and then just try and A, find kind of your groove and technique and B, experiment as well because even if you do find your groove and technique, you're going to end up making music that sounds the same a lot of the time. So it's a good idea to get a guitar if you're not used to playing a guitar or it's a good idea to stop playing the drums or try and jam out another a different style or different vibe just to kind of create something new and different but yeah uh strumble says i'm determined that a half a dozen tracks would suffice to keep it simple sing a songwriter track yeah you don't like what do you want to happen like you don't need that many tracks um yeah you can get great pieces of music that's just yeah a piano so it doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be huge. Yeah, unless you, if you're, if you're writing a really dramatic film score, for example, you, you probably do want a lot of different instruments to kind of add that suspense and bulk it out. But yeah, like I say, it depends, it really depends. But yeah, if anyone's got any questions, let me know. We're going to continue on with this, uh, this track. Um, Max. Do I need Ableton Suite Standard to access more MIDI audio effects or the free cheaper add-ons? Good question. Um, yeah, there's uh, there is. I, rec I recently kind of uh, studied up on this. There is like Melda Productions have some really cool free plugins. Um, they've got like a big bundle of all different free ones. There's stuff like the TDR Nova, which is really cool, which is free. Um, I would say you probably can get a lot of cool um, free ones, but you'll have to do a lot of research and a lot of messing around. But if you get sweet or standard, it's there. Um, so yes is the answer. You probably can get a lot of good free ones, but maybe not all the ones that you want. For example, the wavetable synth in... To be fair, Serum's a wavetable synth as well. The wavetable synth in um, Ableton Live Suite called Wavetable is really cool, but if you've got Serum, it's just as good, really. Uh, I recommend getting Suite or Standard if you can, but if it's just if it's just you just can't, if we don't want to spend that money at the moment. You're still testing out, still testing out Ableton Live or music production. You can always upgrade later on. You don't have to get because it is what was it like six hundred pounds? It's pretty expensive, to be fair. It is good, but there is some cool free ones out there. Um, I would say if you want to take this seriously, you want to make a lot of music, buy Sweet. Um, but you don't need to. 
Uh, Jane, thoughts on that orange box with the play, pause, and the master orange box? This one. Um. Oh, it switches it to the other view, I think. Um, I should, you know what, I can't remember. I think it switches it to the arrangement view rather than the... Uh, so it switches the playback to the other view, this view, rather than the session view, I think. Back to arrangement, yeah. So if in doubt, use if in doubt use quick help. So back to arrangement. When you play session view clips, this button will light up to indicate the current state differs from state which in arrangement. Yeah. So clicking this button makes live play the contents of the arrangement. Yeah. So it switches it to the uh, arrangement view. Yeah. Cool. Um, yeah. So if you've got um, for right now, it's absolutely pointless because I haven't got anything in the arrangement view. But if say you've recorded into the arrangement view and you just want to hear that back, hit that button. Uh, if you just want to hear this one, hit that button. So, right now, yeah, it's, it's not really needed. Uh, Strumble, I've just managed to connect a MIDI keyboard to my MacBook Air. Cool. First one wasn't recognized. Now it's wonderful play and changed the instrument and after those plugins, wow, amazing. Cool. Yeah, well, if um, you might have to set up, if you're using Ableton Live, go over to uh, Live in the top 10 preferences and then go to Link MIDI and um, yeah, set it up here. So, if, try and find your control surface here. Input output, don't necessarily need, but just set it up here. Just have track and make sure track and sync is on for your input. Yeah. But a lot of time, a lot of time we just automatically do it. Uh, Strumble, have you got a set intention for intro, chorus, verse, bridge, outro before you start? Um, no. I know a lot of people do, like for example, a uh, friend Peter Darlin, he he's a lot more methodical when he writes music. He he kind of sets it out a lot more than I do. But me, I'm just kind of jamming out. Like I used to play in a lot of rock bands and stuff when I was younger. Um, so I'm used to just kind of jamming out and grooving, and creating some riffs, creating some ideas, and just finding what works, and then create the chorus, uh, the chorus and the verses and stuff. So for me, it's really just like riffing out, finding the groove, finding some ideas. Make writing loads of different music and then thinking, oh wait, this bit is good. Everything else is awful, <laughs> but this is the bit that I want. So, yeah. But for me, yeah, if I'm if I'm creating something structured like that, like I must make the intro, then the verse. For me, it it, it always kind of feels forced. For me, it's a lot more natural, just kind of just writing and thinking of ideas. But someone like Pete um, would probably disagree with that. So it depends. Yeah. Jane says, enjoying your Udemy course and I've recently put 10 of my tracks on vinyl. Oh, awesome. Nice. Yeah, I've never um, I've never put any of my music on vinyl. It would be pretty cool to hear your own music back on a old vinyl player of all the kind of crackles and pops and stuff. It'd be nice. Yeah. 
Do you have any particular key skill in mind before you start? Um, yeah, I do normally. I tr sometimes I try and force myself to work in the mode, uh, which is basically a scale, but we'll start. The kind of root is around a different note of the scale. So Onian, Dorian, Phrygian, Lydian, uh, Mixed Lydian, Eolian, Locrian. Um, so one of those... I try and do a mode a lot of time, but not always. I do like to try and work in modes, but yeah. No, yeah, I do normally work in the key, for example, now I'm in C minor. The song I wrote yesterday was in C minor again. I should probably use a different key, which is why um, transposing is a good idea. So if you're using a lot of MIDI information, there's no reason why you can't just transpose it all to a different key. Um, yeah. That's not really that audible. So Strummel says, uh, mode seem to be a difficult area for people to understand. Transposing, changing key automatically is the way to go. Um, yeah, if you want, if you want to be really lazy, a lot of mini keyboards do have a kind of transpose button, so you can do that. Um, yeah, <laughs> they can keep the same shapes, but I don't know. You, you can use um, the scale function in live as well. So if you go on uh, MIDI, MIDI effects, you can go on um, scale. Actually, I've got some pretty cool scales here, like, I don't know some of these, like, Algerian scale, pretty cool, yeah, yeah, flamenco mode, so you can use some of these and just drag it in, it'll change your music to this certain scale, which is pretty cool, to be fair, so, uh, yeah, uh, Max, have you made your drum and bass, high BPM, if so, can you tell us about it, um, no, not really, to be honest. Um, I used to go to a lot of drum and bass raves in Bristol like a long time ago. So I was kind of involved in like the the scene as in going to a lot of the gigs, but I never really made it. I never really, uh, yeah, it wasn't really my kind of thing to make music, to be fair. Uh, would you say that Serum is worth it even with wed Wavetable? Um... If you want to use a different DAW, if you're just using Ableton Live, you can do a lot of cool stuff with the wavetable. But you've got this really awesome LFO tool in Serum as well. Like, it's so good. Um, I really like Serum. You've got the effects built in, the matrix, the global, obviously, yeah. So you, it's just a good all-in-one kind of encompassing uh, synth that's got, yeah, some cool wavetable, LFO. You, got, you, know, you can drag your own waves in, which I rarely do. But if you want to... Um, there's loads of different waves, all different wave shapes. You can also like add an LFO to the wave shape. So you can see it moving there. It's pretty cool. You can do that kind of stuff. Obviously, you can change the LFO shapes. Which you can't really do as, as easily in the wavetable. Um, you've got the effects, which is really useful. You, you, my, my answer is... You can pretty much do it all with the wavetable and a load of different effects, but it's just easy and simple, and it's there in Serum. Yeah, I would say. Um, you don't need it. It depends what you want to do. I really like Serum. Um, I actually use the uh, the splice payment thing where you pay like 
ten pound a month for eighteen months rather than paying one hundred and eighty pound because I thought I'm going to get this. I just spend like I just buy it for a couple of months, see if I like it, see if something else better comes along. You never know. Massive X could come out in June and could smash Serum to pieces. Could be way better. Never know. So I'd recommend getting that splice payment deal if they're still doing that. Then when Massive X comes out and if it's way better, you can just cancel Serum. So. But they, once you pay it off, you, you own it. So I, I like that. I think it's pretty cool. I like Serum personally. Um, it's my favourite synth to use. But you don't you don't need it. Uh, have I used Roland Cloud Instruments? What do you think? Um, do you know what? I don't even know anything about Roland Cloud. I'm just going to Google it now. Because a lot of the time I have the internet off when I make music as well. So I'm not, I'm not distracted by going on there. Uh, so obviously on this live streaming thing, it's a separate it's actually a separate device. So I don't want to touch the live stream. Roland Cloud, let's have a look. Oh, it's their the soft sense. I've used a lot of Roland hardware and it's decent to be fair. You know what? I would say if there's some kind of free trial, have they got that? I would say uh have a look, go on the, if they've got a free trial, have a go on that. Um, check it out because I don't know haven't used it it might be awesome might not I don't know cheers Max yeah so uh, if anyone's got any questions about Ableton Live I can show you some stuff in here um, I was meant to use Logic Pro uh, but it won't work <laughs> I updated my operating system earlier uh, operating system was that phones you know the Mac software and Logic will not open which is so annoying considering I'm in the middle of updating my Logic Pro course. So hopefully by tomorrow I'll be able to sort that out. Okay, I'm gonna remove this uh remove this modulation now. But yeah, I like Sarah, I think it's cool. But it depends what you want to do. Uh, sorry, Mike. Yeah, I did. I don't recommend it. Like, it's messed with my whole system. Yeah. F f everyone else, I look online, everyone else says Logic Pro is perfectly fine with the update. But for me, pff, it doesn't work. It's ruined a bit of my screen. All I wanted to do was update Final Cut Pro, okay? And uh, getting a bit of a rant. But that works fine, but everything else, uh, I wish I didn't do it. So annoying. Um, yeah, Ableton Live worked absolutely fine. Yeah, for some reason Logic Pro won't work. Um, not sure. Yeah, I'll probably have to get hold of um, Apple support or something. Yeah, but yeah, Live works fine. Um, it does look a bit slicker. Everything just looks kind of slicker. But if your software doesn't work, what's the point? <laughs> Thank you. 
this thing. I was going to use capture, but I can't remember. It's fine. Yeah, maybe something like that. Uh, Mike says, uh, don't feel bad. I had such problems in the past about Ableton, the 16-track verse recently to try and I haven't played with it yet. This is helpful for everyone, it seems. Cool, yeah. Yeah, I'm just kind of jamming out some ideas already. I just, it's more like a live Q&A, and hopefully I can show you. Maybe show you some of uh, my compositional methods or whatever. Whoa. The one thing that always gets me is the shortcuts. Always always mess up the shortcuts because of these well, different video applications as well where you yeah, always get the shortcuts wrong. <laughs> oh, that's not eight bars. Oh yeah, I've got a monitor. Uh, so it's really just that little two bar thing. Obviously, I'll scuff that up. Might go in here and kind of mess it up a little bit as well. Uh, I want to see. I want to see the piano. Yeah. Playing this with a pick on the bass. Dun, 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 dun. Sort of, yeah. Uh, Strumble dance music seems to have a lot of subcategories. Oh yeah, I do you create many of them? Um, I just kind of make music that I want, what mood I'm in. Um, normally if, yeah. Normally, if I'm in a good, happy mood, I won't want to make music. So, feeling kind of down, or that's kind of where the blues comes from, really. Feeling kind of down or annoyed sometimes can create some of the best music because you've got a lot more emotion, a lot more energy to put in the music. But I won't, I won't worry about the subgenres because these trends come and go. Yeah, if you just focus on that subgenre this time next year, I don't know, maybe it's not hot anymore. Just kind of make music you like that you're into. Well, I wouldn't focus on the subgenres. Um, dance music seems to have a lot. Of, uh, oh yeah, yeah. Is there an ideal way to add a ideal way to add a hardware synth to live? I've got a Nord lead, nice. I just record the audio. Um, use an external instrument, and then you kind of what you do is you record the. Uh, the so you can make the MIDI data in live, and then re-record it into. Um, yeah into Ableton Live. I can't really demonstrate that without getting some hardware stuff out. Um, but yeah, there is a way, use external external instrument. So if you go on um, instruments, check out uh, external instrument. I've got a tutorial on that. You can find other tutorials online, how to use that. That's probably the best way. Then you can get kind of like, get a lot more in time and get a lot more how you want. Or just play it in live if, you're, if you want, want to kind of jam it out that way. Uh, Mike says, what audio video programs are you using? I use one called ScreenFlow, which records a screen. Um, I use one called Final Cut Pro. I use another one called Premiere Pro. Um, but to do this live stream, I'm using something called Wirecast. There's another one called OBS I use as well. So yeah, quite a few different ones. Um, when creating a Strumble, when creating original tracks, is it better to do so alone or of others. I'm thinking of copyright claims, future success. I wouldn't I wouldn't worry about the copyright claims or any of that stuff, man. Just just make music for fun. Like 
sure that like, you could get I don't know what I've done is if I write a song with someone we, we share we share the royalties yes yeah, split it down the middle just it, like a lot of bands like Coldplay do that um, I think U2 do that as well you could probably argue that the edge from U2 probably contributes a lot more than maybe the bass player or the drummer however they, they split all the money it's, it's the reason why that band's still together it's the reason why they've made so many albums together same with Coldplay you could probably argue that the bass player doesn't do as much as Chris Martin the singer but I would just say if you're going to just, yeah, don't, don't even think about making money and copyright for the songs if you're new. Just, just make music. Find people that you get on with, you have a good laugh with. And um, my advice is if you're brand new, make sure you're, if it's in a band or a collaboration, make sure you're the worst one there because you're going to learn quickly. Like if you join the band and they're all laughing at how bad you are, you're going to quickly step your skills up and, uh, yeah, and not want to be seen as the worst one there. So try and find people in your area. Um, if you're not as good as them, just be reliable, be fun, uh, bring the beers or whatever, have a laugh, and then people will want you around and just make music with them. Like, the way I learned music was well, playing kind of piano as a kid, uh, and then just joining loads of bands. It's like it's kind of like when you're a young teenager, you wanna you wanna hang out with the cool kids or whatever. You wanna you, you wanna be like belong to some kind of group. So joining bands is. Uh, that's the way to do it when I was a kid. So it was like collaborating with loads of different musicians, playing the keyboard or the bass or whatever, or, any, or the drums, any kind of instrument, just to get involved as a, just to get involved in the scene and learn about music. And and then we realized how expensive it was to kind of hire any studios. I said, like, oh, I'll learn to record. That's kind of how I got into production. And learning how to produce can be quite a lonely thing. You're stuck in front of a computer all day. You can go a little bit insane, to be honest. So being around people is a great... It's great for the mind because we're social creatures. We're not meant to be stuck in front of these big bright screens all day long, even though most of us probably are nowadays. But collaborate. I would say if you're new, collaborate with as many people as possible. Um, there's like meetup groups. There's like uh, where I'm from. There's like an Ableton Live meetup group. Um, there's loads of music production groups. Gumtree advertises for like band members or collaborations and stuff. There's all different studios you can try and um, just ask people if you can just help out and work for free or whatever. Just get involved. Just like, don't think about copyright. Don't think about royalties or money. Just think, how, how is this fun? Like, how, how am I going to have fun doing this? Because if, you, if you're not, like, having a laugh making music, um, if you do want to pursue it as a career or you do want to take it more seriously, you might not enjoy it. So have a, one of the main reasons I got into music, to be honest, was all the social reasons, like hanging out with other people, having a laugh, you know, been one of the boys or the girls or whatever like doesn't matter just like collaborate with people have fun and then and then produce by yourself i'd say um there are obviously the pros and cons if you produce them with people you might fall out clashes of egos uh like, you know, like swedish house mafia all three of them are great but i'm sure there's like a lot of clashes there's big egos all together so yeah cool that's that's what i think <laughs> a bit of a ramble but yeah um yeah we're, uh Barnablastique, hit me up if you want to collab, I make Afro beats, cool, that's something that, I, like, for example, I don't really know much about Afro beats, for me, so for me to collaborate with someone who knows about Afro beats would be good for me, because it's something I learned a lot more about, um, so yeah, maybe collaborate, I, I've been in so many, like, different collaborations and bands, I used to be in, like, a, a synth metal band at one point, because uh, I was like, because these like metalheads wanted me to join their band, and I was like, "This would be interesting. <laughs> this would be a bit of fun," and it was. Yeah, it's uh, you learn a lot more about like break beats, different time signatures and stuff. If you're playing metal, you, you you're using some some weird time signatures if it's proper metal. So you gotta you got you gotta step up your game a lot of times. So yeah. Oh, I quickly learned to work alone after a partner deleted my work in a joint project. Ah, that's. Yeah, it doesn't sound like someone you want to hang out with. Yeah, obviously, avoid the, uh, yeah, avoid the negative people or whatever, or the ones who are going to delete your work. Um, yeah, try and find people who get on with you, have a laugh. Like some like some of the bands I've played with, some of, some of the guys in those bands are some of my best friends now. So much fun, There's so many funny stories, like playing different gigs and, I have so many laughs and stuff like it's like hanging out with your friends but creating a project as well 
But in this day and age of digital audio workstations, it can get pretty lonely, like just, like I said, just in front of the screen all the time. But you do get more control. If you're a bit of a control freak, maybe you do want to do it. But yeah. Anyway, what was it then? Something to do with this beat. Yeah, if you've got any more questions, hit me up or I can uh, continue jamming this. But it seems like this session, more people want to uh, ask questions and stuff, which is cool. So uh, I'll just continue answering any questions if you've got any. Um, but yeah, if you're part of the Digital Music Masters group, the Facebook group, um, yeah, like use that to collaborate and network. And that's kind of why I created it, so people can meet each other and share ideas and stuff. Um, yeah, it's not a place to kind of spam links or anything like that. But if you guys or, like, or girls want to collaborate on there, it's uh, yeah, it's over three thousand different music producers on there, which is like for me when I started. When I started, like you knew the people in your town. There might be like one or two producers, <laughs> and now in this digital age, thousands of people on our fingertips, which is crazy. Um, Barna Blastic, how many hours would you recommend for a person to learn production? Um. I don't know, man. Depends how depends how quick you pick it up. You get some people like Martin Garrix who say what you want about him, but he's talented. And what he released Animal, well, he created Animals when he's fifteen years old, which to me is insane. Like a little teenage kid making a, one of the biggest dance songs of all time. So some people pick it up faster. Other people, yeah, maybe not quite as fast. But it's that whole ten thousand hours to mastery, which I'm not sure is true or not. Per week, I would say just try and do an hour a day. If you can do an hour a day, if you've got the time to do that, or, or like maybe like five days a week. So if you have a little bit of time, stop watching TV, stop watching Netflix, and just maybe spend like twenty minutes learning some stuff, and maybe forty minutes kind of jamming out some ideas and working on stuff. I'd probably say because now we've got like yeah, like YouTube, and other sites as well. There's so so good for learning stuff uh, you don't have to go to university now like a few years ago if you wanted to learn music production if you want to learn photography you want to learn any skills you had to go to like a college or university and spend a lot of money now you could watch on youtube or udemy or wherever really for a fraction of the price which is well free in some places which is crazy thinking about it but at the same time if you spend all that money to go to university you're probably going to work pretty hard if, if some if yeah, may not do it if it's free in front of you all the time, or you may, I don't know, depends. But yeah, per week, I'd say try and do an hour a day if you can. If if you if you enjoy it, if you don't enjoy making music, I don't recommend doing it. But if you're loving it, if it's a lot of fun, it can for me it chills me out a lot. Um, it relaxes me. Like yesterday after the live stream, I was like finished at midnight and I was wired. I couldn't go to sleep. It was like a, I don't know, like it's crazy. And uh, just from the, the thrill of making music, I don't think it was a live stream. It was the it was the making the music. So for me, it's so much so fun, really relaxing. So yeah, it depends. It's not for everyone. If it's for you, you gotta be like think about music as well. It's not just about um, it's not just about playing the songs and being creative. You gotta be a bit of a nerd as well. You gotta geek out on this stuff. You got to watch a lot of videos, study. You got to learn about synthesis. You got to learn about mixing. You've got to nerd up. Like it's not just like playing the guitar and singing some songs. You've got to be like creative and a geek at the same time, basically. Which um, maybe maybe isn't maybe some people just like the creative side. I've heard loads of people say like, especially in the past, I don't want to learn that geeky stuff. I just want to sing my songs. So you got to kind of have that logical side to you as well. That kind of nerd and also the creative side. Yeah. Uh, Strumble, if I use loop samples from within Logic Pro but change them enough in the MIDI edit, the copyright free. If you use the Apple loops, you can use them exactly how they are and they're copyright free. They're all copyright free. All of the Apple loops are copyright free. If you go on splice.com or sounds.com, they were all it's called royalty free. They were royalty free. So you can use um, them however you want. If you go on a I don't know, like a fame. If you use a famous artist drum beat and rip that off, um, yeah, you're breaching copyright. But any kind of royalty free loops, I recommend looking at sounds.com, splice.com, or the Apple Loops, are pretty cool as well. They're all royalty free, use them however you want. Uh, Logic stuff is all paid for. Yeah, as soon as you buy Logic Pro like for $200 or £200, wherever you are, um, 
you get access to all those Apple loops. And if you go on there, if you don't, I would show you, but if you download all of the different packs and all the different loops, you can use like 22,000 loops, 24,000 loops or something. There's loads, you can use them however you want. You could even make a whole song out of Apple loops and release that if you wanted to. I wouldn't recommend it, because, but you can, why not? Yeah, it's royalty free. Or if you want to be like, uh, I remember like buying the Vengeance packs and they were pretty expensive. They weren't cheap. And now you get splice and sounds, you get this monthly membership, it's pretty inexpensive. And the thing about Vengeance is you've got all these packs and you might only use like one or two sounds. But in splice, you can just go through and just pick the exact ones you want. Same with sounds. So it's pretty cool. Yeah. I don't like that beat. That bass line doesn't work. Uh, I'm just going to call it a great title of example and then the date. Uh, no worries, Strumble. Yeah, cheers, man. Thanks for watching the live stream. Yeah, um, yeah. if you want to just check it, test it out, use the Apple Loops. Um, yeah, there's some really cool royalty-free stuff as well. You can probably get a lot of free stuff royalty-free online as well for free. Um, I said free a few times there. But yeah, you don't have to. Um, yeah, but you do get some really cool stuff on Splice. And Sounds as well, which is a native instrument kind of equivalent, which I've been using. Uh, it's decent, to be fair. So Jane D uh, says, I'm a creative geek. That's what you want. If you want to do music production, you've got to be a creative geek. You've got to get that left brain and the right brain. You've got to, you've got to get kind of that hippie mindset of just being free. And then also, yeah, get that Steve Wozniak out of you and nerd it up. <laughs> um, yeah, there's an architect. Cool. Uh, music producer is a hobby. Nice. Similar mindset. Yeah, I'm sure architects... The same, I'm sure you've got to be very creative. Uh, that's like a, seems like a difficult job, but you have to know what you're doing. If you <laughs> if you design that building wrong, yeah, it's not gonna be it's not gonna be good. Yeah. Um, oh, Strumble, is it easy to get carried away with plugin effects? <laughs> yep. <laughs> Any tips what to avoid for a newbie? Um, learn how to use the stock plugins. I'd say. I would say don't if you're new, don't even buy a third party. Don't don't get any third party plugins. Just learn how to use the stock ones. And uh, like at the end of the day, compressors are compressor. You do, there are some nuances in these plugins, but if you've got all these new shiny plugins, you don't know how to use them properly. There's no point. Like if you're using Logic or Ableton or any of the DAW, learn all the stock. Learn how every single one works, back to front, and then we know how to do that. Get, maybe have a look at some of the third party stuff. To be honest, like some of the, like in Ableton Live, uh, well, it's an instrument, but the sample is awesome. It's so good. And so is the simpler. And Logic Pro, the compress is so good. Like some of these DAWs, some of the stock stuff is really cool. Alchemy as well in Logic Pro, the wavetable synth in, in Ableton Live. Like you don't have to get the third party stuff. Some of the stuff is really cool inside the box. Um, but you do get some you do get some pretty decent like contact is pr pretty good like serum you know it's good so yeah you don't have to get any the the third party stuff but yeah for a newbie 
let's learn this back to front. Uh, like we're pretty spoiled with all these DAWs. If you make a mistake, Command Z. Well, the guy used to um, used to teach me um, was telling me in his day uh, it was tape. And if you want to make an edit, you'd have to <laughs> get a little ruler and like get a blade and glue it together. I was like, man, yeah, a lot different. So, yeah, but it's good in the way and the and bad in the way. Like the, the bar to entry now is a lot lower. Pretty much anyone can get a copy of Garage Band or whatever. Really, not anyone, but most people can get a copy of Garage Band and start making music. So. When people say all oh, the music's not as good nowadays. I kind of disagree. Like, there's a lot more people making music now. A lot more people, a lot more creative freedom. So, yeah. Anyway, I've been talking for quite a while. I haven't really uh, made much of this track. <laughs> but yeah, if you want to ask any questions, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll chat to anyone. No worries, Strumble. Yeah, so, um,. Yeah, man, just learn the stock. Um, maybe, yeah, apart from, like, GarageBand. If you're using any of these big DAWs, Pro Tools, Logic, Reason, Cubase, Studio One, uh, Ableton Live, they're all really good. There's so much good stuff in them. I remember I remember, I got Reason just for the simps. That was so cool. I'm, I'm not sure what it's like now, but they've got some great stuff in there. Like You've got to remember at the end of the day, a lot of it's just marketing companies trying to sell you plugins you don't necessarily need all of them um but some of them are some of them are i've got a handful of plugins that are really good that i use all the time but most of them rarely use them so and you know what my go-to compressor is the logic pro compressor my favorite compressor my go-to sampler um ableton live sampler so Like, I was using battery before. To be honest, it's not that different from the drum rack in Ableton Live. Don't get me wrong. Battery, I've only just started using it, but battery looks pretty cool. There's a lot of stuff you can do down here. All this uh, effects, modulation, editor, and all that stuff. It's pretty cool. But it's not that far off the drum rack. The drum rack comes with Ableton Live, so. However, the main reason, well, I got complete, but the main reason I use battery is because I can use it in Logic Pro. The drum rack, if you're a live user, is great, but you can't use that in, uh, in Logic Pro. And I don't really like the Ultra Beat too much, to be fair, or the drum kit designer. I don't really like the drummer. It's all right, but it's not as good as battery. So, yeah. Right, so I've been talking for quite a while, and I haven't really uh, made much music. So, yeah, let, let me know if you've got any questions. I can carry on talking, or I can just groove out and make some more, make some more of this, or whatever, really. Um... Yeah. the synth mad quiet all the rest of it's pretty loud
play around with that idea. Yeah, see what we got going on. I do a little bit of arrangement now. I haven't really got that much material right now, but uh, let's have a little, let's have a little juggle around. Let's see what we got. Uh, should I wait to see if Ableton release Push Free? Um, almost pushed two out. Uh, I remember them. They did a big Ableton tour in the UK, and I, I went to it and bought Push. I've got Push T. Um, I don't know. You could probably get a second-hand Push Two now. Uh, I haven't heard any rumours about Push Free, but. Yeah, you never know. I remember uh, sometimes these keep it, companies keep it kind of secret, though. I remember I bought a GoPro 6, and like a week later, GoPro 7 came out. Like, oh. So if you buy the Push 2 and Push 3 comes out, oh, you'll be annoyed. Hey, Chris, how you doing? So if anyone's got any uh, audio questions, Christopher Cavallo is the man. So he's part of DMM, Digital Music Masters. He's on the old audio side, the old audio man. Ask Chris about gain staging. Woo! He loves the old gain stage, don't you, Chris? <laughs> so we were just talking about, Chris, um, if uh, any rumours about Push Free. So, uh, haven't heard any. I don't know. But yeah, it's so annoying when you buy a bit of hardware. Because at least, at least for software, a lot of the time it's a free update or cheapish update but when uh when you buy hardware and then the, 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 oh, the update comes out it's oh so so bad so bad yeah but yeah i don't know it's a risk to take push two is pretty decent to be fair for me i i like playing a keyboard personally i'd say i don't know at, at the same time it's good because when I use the push, it makes me come, come up with different shapes and different ideas that I don't normally use. So it's good in a way that I'm not used to it. So it makes me come up with new different ideas. Uh, the step sequencer is cool on there, like step sequencer. Um, but I personally prefer playing a keyboard. But you don't need a push, but it's pretty cool. I personally prefer the APC. I've got APC 40 as well. Um, I really, I really like that. That's, I use that more, probably like ten times more than the push. To be fair, uh, APC is really cool. Akai APC forty, yeah, it's good. But then you just end up getting loads of stuff, and there's not that much space on the desk, unless you have like some crazy pull-out desk with loads of different gadgets, which is good. Uh, Chris said you got a great plug-in today. It's a gain stage, of course it is. Oh, I saw that. I saw you post about that on Facebook. That you can link multiple instances and have one do the reverse of another. Cool. Is that a free one or a paid one? Yeah, I nearly got. I was well. I was meant to get the um, the X for LFO tool today, but then Logic messed up and that threw the kind of plan out the window. So I'm gonna get the uh, the LFO tool. That's the next plugin I wanna get. So for people watching, they don't know what I'm on about, it's by Xfer, so it's similar. if you see Serum, you've got this little LFO thing at the bottom, which you can assign to different parameters. So you can, uh, let me just make a little demo. If it plays. Uh, which it's not. But anyway. So here, let's just assign this LFO to... Oh, it's because uh, I haven't got clips sorted right. Yeah, that's why. That's why. I thought more stuff was going wrong. Cool. So if I just uh, bring up Serum here and I assign this LFO, um, let's just assign this to the, the fill cut. I've already got one of the fill cut on this the sub uh, level. Okay. You can hear it louder. So it lets you do all this kind of cool stuff, but not with Serum, with basically any audio. So that's what I'm looking at. It looks looks decent. So obviously I don't need it for serum, but if I'm using say 
I don't know, like a contact, and I want to get some weird, crazy shapes going with some strings, I can do that with the, with the LFO tool. So, Chris, it's free. Oh, nice. Great for driving gain into saturators, whilst having the outputs turned down by the same amount. Cool. Chris, I can imagine you programming uh, some, something like that of Max for Live. Chris is a... Uh, if anyone's watched the Ableton Live uh, 10 course, Chris is the guy that does the Max for Live section. So he's an expert in Max for Live. So I can imagine, I can imagine you creating some pl uh, some cool plugins in Max. Um, I don't know if people have used I use presets in Max, but I'm not really a, a patcher like Chris is. So yeah, Max for Live is really cool. Um, if you know what you're doing is... It's not, it's not easy though. Uh, Chris says, I'm always finding ideas for plugins. Yeah. I'd make a, I'd make a free plugin for a bit of fun. I know that's the kind of thing you'll be into, I'm sure. Um, so Strummel says, I have a neighbor who's a DJ for dance music. Cool. Pete Monsoon. Apparently he's well known in the genre. I guess he's playing your music. Okay, cool. Collaborate with him. If you want someone to collaborate with, just just go around Pete's house, hang out with him. Just ask if you can, if you want to hang out and try and collaborate with him if you can. If he's already doing a lot of dance music stuff, I don't know if he's a. I don't even know what the word DJ means anymore. Does DJ mean disc jockey or does DJ mean like electronic music producer? Um, it's all kind of blended in. And then, then well, as Deadmau says, EDM is a event dri event driven marketing a lot of the time. So. So a lot of the time the producers end up DJing because they want to play the big shows and get paid more and stuff, but I don't know. Um, Strummel says, what vocal effects would you recommend to experiment for newbie and dance music? Um, I'd have a look at um, Melodyne and uh, what's it called? What's the other um, pitch one? That's probably easier. I've completely gone blank. Um, Melodyne and that other uh, pitch correction one. If you're using Logic Pro, there's one there already. Uh, Adobe's auto, Adore's Auto Tune, yeah, Adore's Auto Tune. I look at that one. That one you can do more cool, kind of like, like trap, uh, like kind of hip hop vibe stuff. Uh, Melodyne's more kind of subtle. You can use also use it for, uh, uh, yeah, other instruments rather than vocals. But the the melo, um, the Auto Tune, Adore's Auto Tune, I think you can get a cool kind of like. You know, that auto-tune effect if you want to do that. Um, you can build harmonies on the, with them as well, which is cool. Uh, I'd recommend getting a vocalist or using a vocalist that can sing in tune well. Uh, it doesn't matter how many funky plugins you put on. If the singer can't sing well, yeah, it's not really going to work. But it's hard to find a good singer, a reliable singer. Uh, you get the Vocoder plugin in Logic Pro, um, Logic Pro and Ableton Live, which is decent as well. Um, Chris says, oh, uh, Boy Boy Wonder says, uh, do you normally start in session view before moving to arrangement view? Uh, I do in Ableton Live, yeah. I like to just jam out little clips, get little ideas going, and then I record it into the arrangement view and then kind of, not st I'm kind of make an arrangement in the session view as well, just move these little blocks around and then kind of glue it together, add some automation, that kind of stuff. But you can also map a lot of the controls to your MIDI keyboard or little dials and knobs and stuff. Um, but yeah, normally I kind of build the song in session and then arrange it in the arrangement view. Um, so Chris says, hi Strumble, it depends on the recording and the rest of the mix. Generally you'll need EQ and compression. Yep. To sit in the mix, you'll likely need a de for taming sibilance. Yeah. Um... Uh, you might want to look. At, you might want to look at gating the vocals if you're recording in a noisy room. Um, I've seen one use some reverb a lot of the time. Maybe some delay. It depends what effect you're after. Um, yeah, Chris also says Logic has flex time and flex pitch for tuning and aligning vocals. Yep. Um, the Logic one's all right. The flex time's good. Flex pitch isn't quite as good as Melodyne. Um, I know waves do a tune as well, which is all right. It's pretty good. Uh, modulation effects such as chorus can help thicken the thin recordings too. That's right, yeah. Yeah, chorus is cool. You get chorus yeah, in any DAW. Isotope, uh, Peter 
Fleming says isotope vocal synth 2. I've never used that. Uh, yeah, I do like the isotope stuff though. It's pretty amazing if you're looking for some interesting vocoder robotic effects. Cool. Uh, Strummel says the effect I was thinking is like the one used by George Michael. What? Callous Whisper? <laughs> what song? Uh, yeah, Vocoder sounds familiar, but I haven't seen that in Logic. Yeah, there's Vocoder. There's a Vocoder in Logic, man. Uh, I have a lot to learn and experiment in Logic. It depends what DAW you're using. If you're using Logic Pro, um, definitely use Flex Pitch, Flex Time, the Vocoder, like the Reverb Compressor, EQ, like Chris said. Um, chorus is cool, like he said as well. The, we want to thicken it up a bit. Um, use a lot of sends and buses. Experiment with that. Oh, Callus. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I can't even. Callus Whisper. I don't think. I think it's got quite a standard vocal mix in Callus Whisper. I don't think anyone really cares about the vocals in Callus Whisper. It's all about that sax. All about that sax. Uh, so Chris says he has a video for Vocoder, if you don't mind me sharing. Cool, yeah. I'm pretty sure we made that video together, didn't we? <laughs> So Chris, uh, Chris does also make some of the lessons with me, and he's the the, the resident audio nerd. Uh, it's called Faith. I can't say I've, have I heard that song. I'm not, if it's a popular one, I'm sure I've heard it. George Michael is a bit of a legend in the UK. Well, he's a legend in the UK, but um, I don't know if I've heard it. Maybe. I can't remember. Well, if it's if it's an old George Michael song, he probably might have used like some. Hardware stuff to actual actual vocoder rather than a soft synth. Not sure. You gotta have faith. Is that George Michael? You gotta have faith. Is that, I can't remember. It's one of those songs that I know, but yeah, I'm not really sure who does it. Cool. Anyway. <laughs> Has anyone got any more questions? Because I'm out of water. Yeah, um, thank you for people commenting on the live stream. I haven't really made much of a song, to be fair. I've just put out a few ideas, but hopefully uh, I've answered your question, or hopefully it's been um, it's been interesting. But yeah, the, the song hasn't really hasn't really taken place, but I'm happy more than happy to answer anyone's questions. What effects should I use to make my track sound more professional? Oh. Uh... effect it, it really depends man like I don't there's the, the obviously there's like the standard EQ compression you know but it depends what you're trying to do um it's not always about what effects it's probably more like you can get a great sounding song with just a couple of microphones recording like a nice preamp it doesn't have to have effects. Like if you record on the piano, you don't really want effects. You just want it to be pretty raw, maybe a bit of reverb. If you're trying to record some kind of sound design stuff, maybe you want to add some crazy modulation. Um, I can't say I can answer that. It really depends, man. It really depends what you're after. But you want to learn the basics of gain staging, EQ, compression. You know, you want to learn about stuff like noise gating, uh, DSN, yeah, using sends for time-based effects like reverb and delay. But they're kind of the basics, and then you kind of want to be a bit more creative about what you're doing. Uh, obviously panning as well, but yeah. Uh, Strum Strumble says, no, it might be a different one. Where strange clouds morphing into weird things? I Is that a song? I don't know. Uh, Chris says, hey, care professional sound start at professional recordings. However, what effects you need at mix stage are like the ones I mentioned above. Yeah, like Chris was saying, just I'd, I'd study up on the basics, gain stage, like EQ compression, that kind of stuff. But at the same time, you want to get a decent microphone. You want to get a decent preamp if you're recording audio, of course. If you're recording MIDI, yeah, you know, software instruments doesn't matter too much. But you want to learn about sound design. You need to learn about like oscillators, envelopes, LFOs, you know that kind of stuff. Um, filters, yeah, but. Um, yeah, it really depends, really depends. But if you record an audio, having like a decent preamp and a good recording space and a decent microphone is a lot more important than what effects you use. So, yeah. Cool. Uh, Parker Fleming, get the 
get it right the source good song good tones can't be can't fix a bad song band recordings with plugins yeah i had someone message me a while ago they're like hey tom i've uh i've recorded a <laughs> i've recorded a song i feel really bad laughing i've recorded a song um it's it's me playing the violin and my friend playing the piano but the recording doesn't sound very good what plugins do you recommend me using to make it sound better and i was like okay um what mics have you used to record? Where did you record it? What preamp? Uh, what was the space like? And they sent me back saying, I recorded it at my house with my iPhone. I was like, what, you plugged like an audio interface into your iPhone? No, 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 just the speaker on my iPhone. Like, you, you can't, you can't, uh, I had to be blunt. It's like, I'm sorry, but you can't get it sounding professional if you're just gonna record it on your iPhone. It's just not gonna happen, unfortunately. Um, like, I wouldn't really even think about what plugins you're going to use. I think about, like, I think about the space, the room you're recording in. The preamp's so important. So get a nice preamp, yeah. Get a nice audio interface. It's got some decent, clear pre's on there. Get a nice microphone rather than plugins. I think in this kind of day and age, we're kind of brainwashed to think plugins are the most important thing. When you hear, like, like I went back, like, you hear some of these jazz recordings that sound amazing. They've got no plugins on that. <laughs> These old ones, they've got no plugins. <laughs> oh, not many anyway. Maybe like a compressor, but not much. Yeah. Anyway, um, thank you for all the Strumble. Thank you for all the advice and Christopher the given and replies have been kind enough to answer when they've been very basic. Yeah, cheers, Strumble. Thank you for watching this live stream. I hope you find it useful. Uh, Chris says professional sound comes from practice and experience. Yep, it takes time and a good ear to develop over time. Yeah, I would, I would continue over that. I would say, you know you're doing the right thing if you look back at your old songs or your old recordings and you cringe. If you cringe and they're awkward, that means you're doing well because it means you're improving, you can hear the difference. If the old recordings, unless you're some kind of child prodigy, but if your old recordings sound still sound pretty decent, then you're probably not developing. You want, you want your old stuff to be cringy because then you know. Yeah, you know you're, you're improving. <laughs> like, I listened to some of my songs from yeah, a long time ago. Oh, the production of that cringe. I don't want to be hearing that, so yeah. <laughs> yeah, um, Strumble says, you've encouraged me to get my MacBook and Logic Pro and MIDI keyboard back out. Awesome. Cheers, man. Yeah, just start making music. Like, like, you, like you were talking about before, like copyright and that kind of stuff. Just have fun. Like, you said you got that, I think you said you got that friend who's a DJ. Um, maybe try and collaborate with them just ask if you can hang out and talk about music or maybe make some beats for them just for a bit of fun because at the end of the day yeah it's, it's meant to be fun all this stuff It's for me it's like, I'm, it's like I'm a kid a lot of time playing with toys that's what I feel like I feel like I'm playing with Lego still but yeah it's, 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 it's a bit more it seemed to be a bit more serious than Lego but in my mind it's the same kind of thing like little building blocks making building stuff it's, it's a lot of fun Jane D, thanks Thomas, enjoy the chat. Thanks Jane, thanks uh, for joining this live stream. Chris says cringe. Yeah, Chris, let me know what, what what's it like when you listen back to some of your old recordings. Is it mega cringy? I mean, the ones where you, when you were like 15 or something. Hopefully, hopefully it is. Because, yeah, whew, for me it's cringe. I remember some of my, my old, uh, some of my old gear. Um, so I've got some low, really old hardware multi-track recorders. And uh, sometimes I go back and I listen to some of the songs and that just just for fun. Hey, Beyond uh, UK Brum. Yo, yo. How you doing, man? DJ Beyond. Oh, Birmingham. Nice. Uh, <laughs> Chris said they're locked far, far away. Imagine, imagine, imagine if all of our original old recordings like from the first year of doing it all got leaked and all got released. Ah, uh, That's, yeah. You hear about the celebrities getting the iClouds hacked. This is kind of the audio equivalent. It's getting your original songs released. So instead of embarrassing photos, it's embarrassing audio mixes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Strumble says, confidence is lacking due to very limited knowledge on a complex entirety for a newbie. Okay. But hopefully in time, it moved towards being enjoyable. Okay. I guess you're at that stage where you get like a few different things, any kind of skill you get... Um, Unconscious incompetence, uh, yeah. Was it uh, unconscious? <laughs> conscious competence, uh, whatever it is, an unconscious incompetence. 
I completely butchered that. But yeah, so you start off doing something and you don't really know what's going on. You're unconscious about it. And then you're then you're consciously incompetent. So you kind of know what's going on, but you still, yeah, you still have to think about it. And then, yeah, I'm completely messing up this whole phrase. But yeah, so uh, my whole point is when you, when you start off, it's not going to be great. You have to learn it. And eventually you kind of get into that flow state where you can just do it. But I guess there's all these tutorials and stuff online like... Man, I didn't know what compression was was for years, really. I was just kind of messing around with the compressor because I, I've been producing for quite a long time. Um, and, yeah, I didn't really know. A lot of this stuff, there wasn't really anyone to teach me. It was just messing around. Now you just go on Google or Udemy or wherever and just, just type it in and you can find an answer for a lot of stuff, which is pretty cool. Uh, Chris says, Strumble, you have to have fun. It's not about book smart. It's about growth. Learn from mistakes and keep going. Yeah, like, at the end of the day... If you make a mistake, just hit Command Z. It doesn't really matter. Like, um, so many big guys don't know how their gear works, but they have to their intuition. Yeah, a lot of it's just kind of trial and error and messing around. Um, yeah, like obviously knowing how the gear works helps. Like when you get a lot of uh, new equipment, it depends what kind of person you are. But for me, um, I just kind of dive in and just start using it. I will I will look at the manual, but not for a while. There's certain type of people, more practical-minded people, who will read the manual and then will start to kind of dipping their toes in the water. But for me, it's kind of jump in and just start doing it. Like that's kind of what you got to do a lot of the time in music. Jump in, start doing it, then refer to like a course or a manual or something, and then uh, yeah, just keep exploring, keep having fun. I would say. Uh, Strumble, relatively speaking, I probably know more than I realise. Yeah, just think about like a lot of this. Like, how much music have you heard? Like, we've probably heard so many, so many hundreds of hours of music in your life. And we've got all these different grooves and rhythms. I just think, like, what what makes me want to dance? What do I think? I'm like, ah, oh, that's awesome. What makes me want to groove? Uh, Chris says he loves manuals. Yes, Chris is a manual reading kind of guy. Uh, yeah, some people are. Some people are kind of jump straight in, see what happens. Chris has put an emoji with glasses. Um pretty sure he's referring to himself could be referring to me i do wear glasses when i'm on the computer but yeah chris is a manual monster yeah cool uh then we've got any more questions i've been rambling quite a bit uh let us know your thoughts my voice is starting to go soon uh strumble says thanks christopher sorry i haven't replied to every reply you've posted it takes me a while to type out the darn text and correct spellings me too man my spelling Woo! i'm glad we got spell checker no worries yeah um yeah but yeah i think like with technology now um we can make mistakes we can make a lot of mistakes i remember one time we booked the studio and uh it was quite an expensive studio at the time and we hadn't even <laughs> we had to like write out <laughs> we had to write a song within like four hours and record it and we haven't yeah so much pressure for us to write a decent song and record it um I remember doing overnight studio sessions where you go there because the night session was cheaper than the daytime session. This is before any of us had any digital audio workstations. Now you can just do it, in, just do it in your on your sofa. You can do it in your spare room. You can do it in your bedroom. You can do it anywhere, any time of day. There's no paying for super expensive studios to record something mediocre. There's no sleeping on the floor of a studio to lay down a drum kit. You can just, just get some loops, get some samples. <laughs> um. Chris says, TG, what's your favourite pie? 3.14159264. Autofill on my phone has its own language. Oh, man, yeah, my autofill is pretty crazy. Uh, Kev says, have you got any top tips on producing songs in Logic? Um, yeah, I would say um, there's a few different ways. You can start off with a drum beat, start off with some chords. I would, I would, a nice way is to start off with a chord progression. So get four chords that loop well together. The last two chords have to kind of blend well together. The other two, you have a bit more freedom. So find some chords that fit well, and then maybe add a nice bass part. If you're new, to start off with a root note. And then just uh, build from there. Maybe add some strings, add a melody. Um, depending how good your ear is, you can sing the melody. Or you can kind of work it out using the root, the thirds, maybe the fifths of the chords. So when the chord changes, maybe move one of the notes of the melody and make sure you land that note of the melody on one of the notes of the chord. 
Or if you have quite a good ear for writing melodies, just kind of sing something in your head. A lot of the time it'll fit. And if it doesn't fit, you can always adapt the chords for it to fit and then build from there. Add a kick drum, add a snare, add some percussion. Um, other way, you could start with a drum beat and kind of create a groove, create a bass line. This is what, kind of what I did with this track. Uh, well, I say track, this little ideas. Uh, create a groove from there. Or other ways, if you're more of a singer-songwriter, you could kind of write a song on the guitar and the piano and then just build up from there and just build around. Depends. I personally like writing around chords probably the best because um, I, I really like playing chords, but it depends. Yeah. Um, cool. I'm a bit curious what Chris was on about about this pie. I'm not sure what he's on about. But yeah, thank you for people watching this live stream. Uh, Strumble says, adding to Kev's question, what key do you recommend to start? Can transpose later? I'm guessing C or G major. Yeah, wow. C is, is just all the white notes. G major is all the white notes apart from the Fs and F sharp. Um, I don't really... You, you can transpose later, but I just kind of like to write in the key to start with. Um... If you're, sometimes I think C can make you a little lazy because you're just using the white notes. Um, I don't think it matters too much about the key. Just keep it keep it simple to start with. Um, yeah. Yeah. Whatever, really. Well, I, I the certain keys I like to play because I like to play them on the piano, so it's a little bit different. But you could play. Yeah. Any kind of key. It depends what mood you're in. Have a play around on modes as well, because a mode is basically a key, but you're kind of like the ho the home note is not the root note. So for example, in C major, C D E F G A B C, but D Dorian, which is the second one, D Dor, which is so it's D E F G A B A C D. So instead of having, uh, yeah, in D major you have the F sharp and the C sharp. You're flattening the third and you're flattening the seventh to make it a Dorian. So you're getting a different kind of vibe. So it's kind of a C major, kind of like a D minor, but you got that flattened note, um, sharpened note for the minor. So it's a little bit different. So have a look at modes. It's, it's all different. Yeah, just learn the modes. I talk about this in my music theory course. Um, yeah, I really like modes. Have a listen to some kind of different music. Have a listen to some like jazz or something a bit more weird and try and get it. Bit of an ear for modes, really, because modes, modes are cool. I've listened to some John Cool Train or something like that. You get some some cool ideas. Um, okay, Chris has been weird talking about Pi. Um, DJ Beyond UK Brum says, Someone said to me using samples from a sample pack is cheating if you drag and drop the loops. I kind of agree. I think if you drag and drop the loops and use them exactly as they are, that's cheating. But if you kind of drag and drop the loops, chop them up, move them around, really kind of make it a bit more creative and change it, reverse it, reverse bits, change bits, move them about, then you're making something new. So I would say if you're just getting the apple loop and drag and dropping it, yeah, it's kind of cheating, but there's loads of stuff you can do, loads of stuff. Um, Chris says that that's a limiting belief. There's absolutely nothing wrong with samples as long as you're being creative and having fun. Many of the most popular songs, including hip hop, were born from sampling. Yeah, but hip hop was born from sampling, but they were using it in a creative way. They weren't just stealing other people's material. They were sampling and making something unique. And then they, when they put their lyrics over the top or when they kind of produce these beats and samples, it sounds completely different. So there's a lot of famous people like who are great at sampling, really good. So, yeah. Right, has anyone got, anyone got any more questions? Because my voice is starting to go. Christopher says, it's like having a guitarist is cheating if they design and build their own guitar. Uh, if they didn't design and build their own guitar. I disagree with that. <laughs> but, yeah. Yeah, I think it's a great building block. A lot of the times you can actually get some loops and then build a song around the loop then take the loop out. And then you've built something around that loop, but it's completely new and fresh. So that's something you could do as well. So, yeah. Cool. Anyone got any more questions before I shoot off? I haven't really done that much on this track, to be fair, which is quite good. I thought it'd be nice to have a Q&A session. Um, and also, I was planning to build on the track I did yesterday. So hopefully by the next live stream, I'll have that sorted and we can create something else. But yeah. 
Anyone got any last comments, questions, feedback? Pow, 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 pow. Thank you for everyone watching the stream. I really appreciate it. It's been uh, two hours now. Yeah, cool. Uh, Strumble says, look forward to joining you and Christopher in the next live session. I've put notifications on subscription. Cheers, Strumble. Nice one. Thank you for asking questions and contributing to this live stream. I hope uh, we've managed to uh, answer your questions and, uh, yeah, give you some uh, help and advice. Cool. Right, I'm going to head off and uh, try and fix Logic Pro and have a look at, again at the LFO tool by Xfer. Just looks like a lot of fun. But yeah, thank you for everyone watching this live stream. I'm going to head off. Cheers, and I will talk to you soon.